Hey, hey, you guys. I hope everyone is doing well. Once again, Auntie Cuckoo has got another murder story for you guys. And it's one of, you know, I, I hate to say like my favorite topics, but it's one that interests me, should I say. It's about kids killing. Um, so buckle up, baby, because it's story time with Auntie Cuckoo. So this story takes place in Bellevue, Idaho. Um, in September 2003, the key players in this story, do you guys love my spider? Um, cause it's October. I got super fun hair going on, but I wanted to rock my headbands. I've got fun ones. Anyway, so the story takes place in Bellevue, Idaho, early, um, in the morning in September 2003. Key players in the story are Alan Johnson, who's a landscaper, his wife, Diane Johnson, who is a tax collector, their daughter, Sarah. Johnson, who's 16 years old. Um, other key players would be her boyfriend, Bruno. So let's get into the story, right? All right. So early in the morning in September 2003, shots are fired. Diane, the mom, is shot in bed while sleeping. The dad, Alan, is in the shower and he hears the shots. So he comes out and is shot. So Sarah claims that she hears a shot, wakes up, yells her mom's name, Mom! And then all of a sudden, hears a second shot, so she runs out of the house over the neighbors to call 911. So she calls 911, and the police come, <clears throat> and the police find two knives at the end of her parents' bed, and while investigating the house, they also found an, another knife in her older brother Matthew's bedroom on his bed. Now, Matthew was 22 years old and away at college at the time when this all happened. So he's not really a key player in the story, but a knife is found on his bed. So um, <clears throat> there's also on the property, Sarah's parents have like a guest house, kind of like a mother-in-law suite. And there's a man named Mel Spiegel who rents this guest house on their property. So the police go into the guest house and they find a scope to a rifle on his bed. So they're investigating, they're looking around, and the police decide, let's go ahead and lock down the neighborhood, lock down our perimeter. And thank goodness they did because the garbage truck was literally one house away from picking up the Johnson's trash, their outside garbage. Well, the police locked it down so it didn't get picked up. So police check the outside garbage, and in the outside garbage, they find a pink bathrobe, a leather glove, 25 caliber ammunition, and a plastic glove. So um, the murder weapon ends up being Mel's rifle. So the scope was found on his bed, but they end up finding out that Mel actually has a rifle. So... They start looking like, where is Mel at then? You know, the murder weapon is his gun. The scope's on his bed. He lives on this property. Where is Mel? So they're looking for him. They can't find him anywhere. I'm sorry, I keep messing with my eye. I have something in my eye. It's probably fuzz from my headband. <laughs> Anyways, so they're looking for Mel. They can't find Mel. Um, finally, they do locate him. And it turns out that he is actually in Boise, Idaho, visiting family members. And so they're talking to him. And he suggests that they should look at Sarah's boyfriend. So they check out Mel. He's good to go during the murder. He's in Boise, Idaho with family. But he says, you guys, if I were to tell you anyone to look at, I would look at the daughter's boyfriend. Ba -dum -bum. So they're like, all right, what's this all about? The daughter's got a boyfriend. So they look into this and it turns out that Sarah, who is 16 years old, is dating a young man named Bruno Santos, who is 19 years old and happens to also be an illegal immigrant from Mexico. So the parents do not approve of this relationship. And it turns out that Mel tells them, the guy who's renting the guest house, tells the police that a few weeks before this murder happened, Sarah's parents actually got into a fight with the boyfriend. Sarah had said she was spending the night at her girlfriend's house, Come to find out, the parents found out that she was actually at, um, did I say she was staying at her boyfriend's? I'm sorry. She told her parents that she was staying at her best friend's house. Come to find out she was staying with her boyfriend. So the parents go and pick her up and take her home. And they tell the boyfriend, stay away. Stay away from her daughter. You know, she's 16. You're 19. You know, 
apparently he's a dropout, you know, he's an illegal immigrant, he's um, been charged with multiple thefts, all sorts of crap. So he's just, you know, not someone that someone would love to have their girlfriend or boyfriend or kid dating, you know, whatever. So anyways, turns out that Santos, Bruno Santos, didn't take the recommendations by the parents to stay away from their daughter very seriously because not only do they continue to see each other they actually end up having sex in sarah's parents house so the parents are pissed so everyone thinks it's got to be the boyfriend the boyfriend had to kill diane and alan because just a few weeks before the murder this confrontation happened and the dad had actually threatened bruno that if he did not stay away from his daughter he was going to press statute press statutory rape charges and have him arrested, sentenced, and deported. So they thought, you know, the boyfriend's probably pissed and murdered the parents. So the police get a search warrant. They go to Bruno's house and his mom's like, no, he was here all night. He was here all morning. He's been with me. But that's his mother, you know, like you got to be iffy about that. So police get, you know, DNA. They do fingerprints. There's no blood, nothing. They can find nothing to tie Bruno to these murders. Absolutely nothing. So who does that leave? Sarah. So they begin looking at sweet little, sweet 16 year old Sarah. Well, Sarah was taking antidepressants. Sarah had a very rocky relationship with her mother and apparently her father, too, over the boyfriend. She claimed she was in love with him, you know, that they were going to get married and spend the rest of their lives together. Her parents forbid them to see each other. So, after the murder, the other thing is that Sarah, like, absolutely did not grieve her parents' death at all. Literally, like, at the funeral, she's in the corner, like, laughing with her friends, talking to people, like, oh, yeah, we're going to go get our nails done after this. Like, so not grieving, not a normal response at all, which I myself, as many of you can relate, everyone's a little bit different and reacts to, you know, death and whatnot differently, but we're sure as shit not like, is this funeral over? Let's go get our nails done and go to a party with our friends. That's not the way it works. So anyways, the family starts getting a bit suspicious about this. So the police, like I said, we're looking into Sarah. The police find out that Sarah would actually clean the guest house for Mel from time to time. So she knew exactly where that gun was placed in his closet behind his stuff. Also, they start finding inconsistencies in Sarah's story. She had claimed when she heard the first gunshot, she was sleeping in her room with the door closed. Well, when the investigators got there, forensics, not only was there blood, but bone and tissue matter on her walls, on her door. But, you know, when your door is open, those hinges are there. The hinges were covered in it. So they knew she was lying about the door being closed when she heard the first gunshot and the second. Um... Also, family members identified that pink robe that was found in the Johnson's trash outside as being Sarah's. So, police luminol, they find no blood on Sarah's PJs at all, but they luminol the, the bathrobe. They don't find anything on the front of the pink bathrobe, but they find it on the back of the bathrobe. So, here's a question. Who was wearing the bathrobe? Was it Sarah? Was it Bruno? Maybe it was the college brother. Who knows, right? So police are like, how are we going to do this? So Sarah, the PJs that she was wearing that they had already luminoled, had a paint stain on them. So the paint transferred to the robe. They were able to tell that Sarah was the one wearing the robe. Also, they swabbed the leather and the um, latex glove and got Sarah's DNA from the inside of that as well as there was gunshot residue all over the robe um, and Sarah or the gloves that Sarah was wearing. So I want to make sure I'm not leaving anything out. Bear with me. So the last question, I'm not. So the last question that police had was if Sarah was wearing this robe backwards, okay, that explains why there's no blood or anything on her PJs. She had the gloves on. That explains her hands. But how was her hair? Her hair wasn't wet. She hadn't washed it. How was her hair not covered in blood and bone and tissue matter? So that was the last question. They didn't know. But they proceeded anyways. So Sarah, in October of 2003, at 16, I, I don't know. Yeah, she was still 16. She was actually charged as an adult. Okay. And her boyfriend, Bruno, that, you know, they think she did this all over, ended up actually prosecuting 
actually testifying for the prosecution mainly to prove that he had nothing to do with this at all. He said that Sarah had talked about wanting to kill her parents, but he thought it was just normal frustration and anger that he was no part to do with the plan or anything. And that's why he testified against her. So here's the kicker, a little zinger. You guys know I love to throw in a zinger or two. So several weeks later, plumbers are called because there's an issue with the plumbing in the Johnson home. Come to find out, as the plumber snaked that toilet, what do they find? A shower cap. So that was the thing that Sarah had over her head that covered her so that she had no blood, tissue, bone matter, nothing on her. Wildness, right? So anyways, Sarah, 16 years old, ends up being charged, um, guilty, charged as an adult for both of her parents' murder, is sentenced to two life sentences with no possibility of parole. So at 16 years old, she will spend the rest of her life in jail. No parents to support her. I'm not sure if family members are or not. That's a t sticky situation, right? Anyways, so that's another Marty story for you, courtesy of yours truly, Auntie Cuckoo. I hope everyone is staying safe and happy and spreading love and kindness. And that's what I got for you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. Make good choices. Um, oh, my girl, Melissa, you're cracking me up, girlfriend. But that's what I got for you guys. So stay safe, and I'll talk to you later. If you're not already, be sure to subscribe to Storytime with Auntie Cuckoo on YouTube. Like, share, do it. Put your booty into it. Do it, do it. Stay safe.